September 8th. But the natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2.14 The mere presentation of truth to the unrenewed mind, either in the form of threatening, or promise, or motive, can never produce any saving or sanctifying effect. The soul of man, in its unrenewed state, is represented as spiritually dead, insensible to all holy spiritual motion. Now upon such a mind, what impression is to be produced by the mere holding up a truth before its eye? What life, what emotion, what effect will be accomplished? As well might we spread out the pictured canvas before the glazed eyes of a corpse, and expect by the beauty of the design, the brilliancy of the coloring, and the genius of the execution. We would animate the body with life, heave the bosom with emotion, and cause the eye to swim with delight, as to look for similar moral effects to result from the mere holding up to view divine truth before a carnal mind, dead in trespasses and sins. And yet there are those who maintain the doctrine, that divine truth, unaccompanied by any extraneous power, can affect all these wonders. Against such a theory, we would simply place one passage from the sacred word. Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. The sacred word, inspired though it is, is but a dead letter, unclothed with the life-giving power of the Holy Spirit. Awful as the truths it unfolds, solemn as are the revelations it discloses, touching as are the scenes it portrays, and persuasive as the motives it supplies. Yet when left to its own unaided operation, divine truth is utterly impotent to the production of spiritual life, love, and holiness in the soul of man. Its influence must necessarily be passive, possessing as it does no actual power of its own, depending upon a divine influence extraneous from itself to render its teaching effectious. The 3,000 who were converted on the day of Pentecost were doubtless awakened under one sermon. And some would declare it was the power of the truth which wrought those wonders of grace. With this we perfectly agree only adding that it was truth in the mighty hand of God which pricked them to the heart and wrung from them the cry, Men and brethren, what shall we do? The eternal spirit was the efficient cause and preached truth but the instrument employed to produce the effect. But for as accompanying and effectual power, they would, as multitudes do now, have turned their backs upon the sermon of Peter. Though it was full of Christ crucified, deriding the truth, and rejecting the Savior of whom it spoke, but it pleased God, in the sovereignty of his will, to call them by his grace, and this he did by the effectual, omnipotent power of the Holy Spirit, through the instrumentality of a preached gospel. Thus, then we plead for a personal, experimental acquaintance with and reception of the truth before it can produce anything like holiness in the soul. That it has found an entrance to the judgment merely will not do, advancing not further, arresting not the will, touching not the heart, renewing not the whole soul. It can never erect the empire of holiness in man. The reign of sanctification cannot have commenced. The mental eye may be clear, the moral eye closed, the mind all light, the heart all dark, the creed orthodox, and the whole life of variance with the creed. Such is the discordant effect of divine truth, simply settled in the human understanding, unaccompanied by the power of the Holy Spirit in the heart. But let a man receive the truth in his heart by the power of God himself, let it enter there, disarming and dethroning the strong man. Let Jesus enter, and the Holy Spirit take possession, renewing, sealing, and sanctifying the soul, 
and then we may look at the fruits of holiness, which are unto eternal life.